Okay, calling the meeting to order. This meeting of the Reading Municipal Light Department of Commissioners is being videotaped at RMLD's office at 230 Ash Street, Reading, Mass, for distribution to the community television stations in Reading, North Reading, Wilmington, and Linfield. The RMLD Board of Commissioners recognizes the, recognizes the importance of hearing public comment at the discretion of the chair on items on the official agenda as well as items not on the official agenda. We ask that all questions or comments from the public be directed to the chair and that all parties, including members of the RMLD board, act in a professional and courteous manner when addressing the board or responding to comments. Once recognized by the chair, all persons addressing the board shall state their name and address prior to speaking. It's the role of the chair to maintain order in all public comment or ensuing discussion. All right, introductions. We have Citizen Advisory Board Chair Dennis Kelly. Welcome. Thank you. And Phil, will you be secretary this okay. evening? Thank you. And it doesn't look like we have any of our select board liaisons or the financial committee. This doesn't hear. Um, all right. Well, we have two. Um, we have, I think we have news that we have. It hasn't been officially done, but we, we have no challengers to Phil and Dave, right? So I don't know if I can say that. It looks like you guys are going to be reelected coming back. So mm -hmm. that's good. Should, uh, Excellent. Yeah, it should happen. Yeah, yeah. Assumingly, they assume they get at least one don't vote. Don't forget each. to vote for yourself. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you do have to get at least one vote, even though you're the only two on the ballot. So good luck. Good luck with the election. We want any <laughs> And... Um, Dennis, any comment from you? Um, no, uh, happy to be here, and um, uh, we can give you a little update on the uh, citizen advisory if you want. Yeah, we why don't you met. do? We were both there. Um, I think we're probably going to cover most of it, but if yeah. you want to just give a top line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we basically, you know, Colin shared and Hamid shared uh, information about the past couple months and um, service areas with all the, the storms we've had and the minimal outages based on. Um, you know those wind storms and different things we had and you know it goes to show a lot of what the, they're doing is working and starting to improve because we didn't have the outages so that was good um we also um made a motion on a purchase power agreement and the cab i think you guys will be looking at that tonight as well yep. so the cab passed that um and um other than that i think it's about yeah the only other thing at the end of the meeting dennis we heard uh talking about electric bus possibility yep. and the four towns and charging stations to support that so if we can use the you know the government vehicles and the the school vehicles yep. and make them electric at some point and they're just talking about the timing Chuck was talking about and Colleen about the timing of purchases to yep. be talking in communication with the towns good uh, no public comment it looks like tonight thank you Dennis and why don't we get some approval of the minutes if we have um, Phil, you want to yeah, read these? Yeah, I'll move that the uh, board approve the meeting minutes of December 20th, 2018 and January 24th, 2019 on the recommendation of the general manager. Second. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Mm. Motion carries 5 zero, zero. Okay, now we have the RMLD board member in attendance. Of the, oh, we already did that. Okay. We covered the number six. All right. And the general manager's report, Colleen? actually going to Chuck did such a great job at the cab meeting I think I'll let him uh, talk about uh, this was his first year he came with me down to the uh, legislative uh, rally mm. thank you again for letting me go speak on behalf of uh, the, the little guy us um, but um, I think Chuck enjoyed himself so we'll let, uh, let him get some face time here. all right Chuck good evening good evening I'm not sure whether it was the highlight of the trip or not, but I got to sit next to Joe Kennedy and then come back and tell uh, the rest of the staff here that I got to sit next to Joe Kennedy. <laughs> <laughs> it's Joe, Joe, Joe. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh. Joe, Joe, Joe. Right, yeah. No, we, we, we had the opportunity to go down and uh, meet with uh, our representatives and senators from Massachusetts 
and to convey to them uh, issues of concern back home. Uh, one of the first things that uh, we shared with them was that uh, the voters uh, in their districts uh, were owners of our system and as owners um, wanted to be sure that uh, the value of their uh, interests was uh, protected. And then we began to share with them what some of the issues were. Uh, the issue that uh, I was most responsible for uh, when I was in uh, these sessions uh, was talking about the wholesale market, because uh, that is uh, my current uh, area of expertise. And what we wanted to convey to them was uh, Iceland, New England runs a very complex market. Um, we can deal with that. What we can't deal with easily is that it is a very volatile market, that prices uh, fluctuate from year to year, and that every time there is a capacity auction for the last 13 years, it has been a different set of rules. Now, ISO uh, is taking the uh, position that that's necessary because people are figuring out how to game the system. But I look out and I see that we have a New York Stock Exchange, which seems to function uh, fairly well in, in exchanging uh, shares of stock. We have the Chicago Mercantile, which seems to function fairly well in the exchange of commodity. And the last I knew, electricity was a commodity. So I'm not sure why between a stock and a commodities market, they can't figure out something that would work. But uh, that volatility in pricing uh, and the instability of the process uh, makes it very difficult for capital intensive businesses to plan their future. What do we invest in? Uh, one example of that, um, the capacity market uh, about 10 years ago was $2.50 a KW month. This uh, last month, the auction settled for 2023 at uh, $3.80 a KW month. But in between, uh, around 2009, 2010, it was up over $10 a KW month. That is a 500% swing over a 10-year period. And the reason for that is that ISO isn't able to manage the planning process anymore because of their market structure. They instead uh, put it out to bid. And whatever the bid comes in is what they pay. Their job isn't to maintain uh, a stable cost structure. It is to make sure that there is electricity available uh, and it's silently added at any cost. So it's a very difficult uh, market to do business with. And because ISO is regulated by FERC, we shared that with uh, our representative um, bodies uh, while we were there. Chuck, what's your ask of them? What are you asking them to do? Uh, to go back to FERC and have FERC review the market structure and come up with uh, a better approach that is transparent and takes the volatility out. Um, it used to work that way right? back when it was Nepal. We want to get that message to them through the formation of a blue ribbon committee. So what everyone asked for each of the representatives or the delegation was can we form a blue ribbon committee that can get, then go put the pressure on them? Because there isn't one entity in particular that's responsible for controlling ISO, and FERC is appointed by the president. So you, it's, it's, it's really uh, a complex um, concept of what we're dealing with with capacity in the markets, and then the, it's complex in who's responsible for it because it, it seems like no one is. Mm. So we're, we're this Blue Ribbon Committee that we asked for um, would, would help to at least to have a set of people that understand exactly what it, what it means. And we had a panel there with these um, experts in the field. Uh, you probably know some of them from NEPA, but they took us from the late 80s all the way to present of how the capacity market got to where it is. And it was extremely interesting and I've asked NEPA if maybe they would get those same 
people to do that at the NEPA conference because yeah, I I'd think love to see that. a lot yeah. of the managers and a lot of the commissioners would really That's good. be able to understand it better. If you heard the whole thing from beginning to end, you'd, you'd probably see what the problems are. But to get everyone that's a there's a stakeholder yep. to make the changes with the government together to hear that is is what we're trying to get. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Now the the Blue Ribbon Commission was sort of the flagship idea that that we presented, uh, but we did cover uh, three or four uh, other topics. Uh, we had a very limited time. We had uh, less than 30 minutes with each representative or representative's staffer. So uh, to put complex issues on the table, you can't put a lot out there. Uh, but we did cover uh, three or four other uh, issues while we were there. Um, we talked about uh, allowing 5G uh, onto the poll systems and the um, FCC has given a 90-day window uh, for review and approval of these. Um, I pointed out that it's going to be very difficult for some communities to address that issue since their bucket trucks go to 40 feet and we have to put 55-foot poles up there uh, to do it. Uh, all of that infrastructure is going to have to be replaced in order to uh, service things. So it's not as easy uh, as they would like it uh, to be. Uh, Colleen, did you want to cover the no, rest? We just said that, you know, this uh, ruling that they made, and we have to quickly uh, address them. They're not talking about logistics or safety. We don't even know who would be installing them, who would be touching them, whether or not these antennas would be disconnected. They are live. You know, who's going to be authorized to go into the electric space? I mean, there's a lot of things that are have not been addressed before they make the rule, which is kind of backwards. backwards. So we're just saying there's a lot of things to consider here. Uh, so we asked the legislators to, again, you're talking about the FCC. So who ex exactly is in charge of the SEC to make them understand that, we, you know, we need to address the logistics of this before we can just start having time clocks? Colleen, so. We've talked in the past about the problems with dual pole ownership, right? Yeah. And so would that also, in addition just to covering 5G, would, would that also be swept in in terms of, uh, you know, consideration for either well, they, legislation there could be or change? Because that's going to yeah. still be a problem, right? That You're talking about if, uh, if like, AT&T or someone wants to put up their own pole and get permission from the town so they can put an antenna well, up? Well, I'm thinking more, we've talked about some of the problems with uh, security of power because they, not to blame Verizon, but let's say they don't take care of their responsibility because the, they own the pole or something we want to do is preventative. We almost have to just go fix it in the name of safety, right? right. As opposed to, you know, there's no, there's no right. re regulations that say, you know, in this case, you know, either or party is, you know, obligated to or can interfere. I'm not sure I understand the well, question. Well, just I'm just saying this whole 5G issue brings up that whole complexity of when you have dual ownership, right? I mean, this uh, who's responsible at the end yeah. of the day? The, the owners will still be Verizon and RMLD. It's just who's going to be allowed at the top of the pole and how would how is that? How are they going to be installed? How are they going to be powered? How are they going to be maintained? What happens if the pole gets hit? I mean, right now we're waiting for the ball in court for everyone's attachments. You know, this is a lot more complicated. I don't know if you've seen a pole with five or six antennas at the top. It's very sure. complicated on top of the aesthetics of poles already. Yep. So, you know, there are some communities that have some. You know, down the road with autonomous cars, are we looking at, you know, five or six carriers at the top of every pole? It's not clear. You know, we don't really have a program or understand it very well before the rules start coming out. That's so, yeah. that's I really guess what, what I'm saying. This, there's already a, a, probably a lack of rules to begin with, right? So it's, you'd like to think somehow that gets addressed yeah. before you start adding more complications. That's in the so. 1946 indenture for the joint agreement. <laughs> I was just reading that today. I have a couple of questions. Lots couple of whereases. <laughs> Go ahead, Dad. Um, so have we gotten any 
inquiries from the carriers looking to be on our polls yet? No? Okay. So we can establish application forms, standards, technical and aesthetic standards, and we can impose them. Yes, we, you. Um, it's, it's within the utility's right to do that. So we, we don't have to do this now, but I can certainly, it's something I've learned a lot about in okay. recent months, put it that way. So I can, I can So help. you're familiar with the stop I, Actually, yeah, I mean, that, but also what you're able to do, and actually you, ha you, you have more, you have more say than, than you might appear by just reading this FCC order, which was not written with the kinds of complexities that you're, that you're discussing in mind. So the utility does have a lot that you can do. So talk okay. off. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's good. Yeah, does that lead to what uh, we can charge as well? You can charge, yeah, you can charge an application fee. You can recover your costs. You can set, um, you can set standards on what can go up and who does the work. And there has to be shut off switches. And um, uh, you know that you can shut it off. That, that, that they have to have clear labels on there. That you can say no to certain polls if it has primary on it, or um, you know if it's got a, if it's got stuff on there, you can say no. You can't be on those polls. They can't just go show up and start climbing up polls. I don't think that the uh, the attachment fee is it, it's now bound just like a Comcast attachment. It's not. Um, yeah, they've set some minimum what they call safe harbor, like what you you can charge certain rates, but if you can justify that your costs for for processing and dealing and maintaining this are higher than these FCC numbers, you can set higher numbers also. So there's a bunch of things. Um, okay. I think yeah. you should give us a training session. Well, I mean, you know, there's, just did. there's not much. There's, oddly enough, it's reasons. something I've become, I've gotten to know fairly well. So we could talk off, off good. Yeah. about that. Yeah, great. That's yeah. good news. Yeah. I, I would like to see the, on the commissioner board. Mm -hmm. I would like to see the history of the electrical thing, and I, yeah, me too. I have this sense that there's probably some consolidation in the industry by private equity firms taking over certain parts of it that have tried to skyrocket the rates and game the system. Um, everywhere because that's what they do that's what they do for a living so I'd be One very of the interested things to see Chuck that. talked about earlier at the cab meeting was uh, you know this capacity volatility if if we're dealing with our commercial customers on a shred the peak um, shared benefit well if one year it's way up high and, and then the next year it's not I mean they can't count on that uh, shared benefit either so it affects our customers wanting to be part of that program because if it's not if they're not going to make a good benefit, they're not going to, you know, pu push a shift off, say, or something like that. So. Excellent. All right. Any other questions, comments? Uh, Just a tax exempt bond. We we uh, that was the third point that we talked about that we want to keep tax exempt bonds. So. Did did they have any comments about uh, PG&E and the disaster that it is, and when they're reorganizing? California's utility industry, right? No, that wasn't Didn't discussed. We try not to discuss disasters. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm That's thinking we should take away. them over. <laughs> there, there may be like 10 or 15 things that we want to discuss with them, but we try to hone it in on them like of course, three major yeah. points. Because as right. Chuck says, we run in, we have to talk about something very complex, and then we're out of there. So we want them to have a takeaway that they remember. Right. Yeah. So. And Chuck, you were actually one of the speakers for our group. I, yes, yeah, every, everybody is there and nobody has a designated uh, spiel that they go through. But yes, I participated in offering up points. Yeah, yeah, good. You have more stuff for us, Chuck, don't you? Later I do, yes. Okay. Great. Yeah, I just have... Um, And then it's me again. Do you want to go back and forth with you? <laughs> <laughs> I like swimming in the fish barrel. I, I just wanted to give an update that, uh, you know, with uh, meeting with each of the town managers, administrators, and, and the selectmen that um, I, in the past I already talked about Reading um, in Wilmington. And uh, so this past Monday I met with Linfield. So I was able to meet the new town manager, and then that night we met with the selectmen. Uh, I did the basic presentation that we did at the Reading Town meeting. Uh, they had some additional conversations on us helping them with uh, some solar projects, if possible. So Chuck's going to help them with that. 
we had some requests on um, commercial auditing for their water uh, water uh, system that's in Linfield, and then the other one was uh, Chuck came with. Why me. would we be involved in a water? water. Yeah. Uh, efficiencies of pumps and stuff. We would do uh, commercial auditing as. Oh, like as the electricity company. efficiency. Yeah. Okay, good. Correct. Um, so solar and and what was the third one? Oh, the green green, co green communities. Green communities. So green communities is like the mass collaborative where in our bill we, we collect a charge for to pay for the rebates and everything. And green communities is something that like Grid and Eversource has. So they have millions of customers. So they have a lot more money to pay rebates. Um, and so the town manager there is coming from another town that had green communities. So he wants us to be part of it, but we can't really be part of it because we don't pay into it. But we're, we are going to look into it a little bit more. The director of Green Communities lives in Linfield. So we're going to talk about a some kind of a partnership, a, a, a segue to our rebates, to their rebates, and see if we can do something within the boundaries of the law and, and Chapter 164. So uh, it was a great meeting. Uh, they extended compliments to Reading and the workers and, and, uh, and said we do a ni nice and neat job. So yep. yeah. did, and I did he echoed that and the in the cab meeting just a, an hour did, ago. Did he mention the diff rate differential between our rates to mm -hmm. part of Linfield and the other part of Linfield that's... <laughs> well, it's PBD is the other part, right? It's not bad. PBD, PBD, PBD is about bad? the same. No, it's not bad. Is it about the same? Yeah. It's the PBD municipal It is a little plant. less because they have a uh, couple of 50 megawatt generators. Ah, okay. So yeah. I asked the same question. Yeah. We're on the same wavelength. <laughs> we are. I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then the other uh, issue... Oh, yep. Uh, I don't know if the other folks here have had the same experience. There's a lot of communications coming out now on solar, you know, from companies and marketing, yep. and I just wonder if, if there's an opportunity at some point, or if there may be confusion in the consumer level around, you know, uh, gee, I have power, but, you know, should I be getting solar, you know, because everyone's mailing me all kinds of things. And right. So I, I don't know if it's a marketing opportunity to well, let people know. Yeah. I know we, we already do that. You know, it's different. We actually just ran uh, some community events with the chamber and uh, info, info sessionals that, remember, we had talked about uh, running them for brand new um, folks that are buying new homes for the yeah. first time. Yeah. We've been running those right. in the libraries and different yeah. things, yeah. and yeah. we talk yeah. about the whole solar programs and tell them what they need to do if they want to go solar, what the benefits they might be able to um, save. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I think also, but just. <coughs> residents in general because of, you know the, these companies are mass mailing things right. to, to we're on a little bit of a hole with our next community solar just because the recs uh, offset the financial economics a little bit but I think Chuck's working on that and we'll put out another press release on <laughs> where we land with that okay um, <coughs> the next one I'm going back to Reading uh, I'm actually meeting with the town manager on March 25th which is Monday I was going. I was on the agenda for Tuesday, March 26th, but they have such a, a tight agenda. They're moving me to May, so um, and I won't do the same one I did before. They're actually looking more of a an electric utility 101 type presentation, kind of a the highlights for each of our divisions in in basically you know what what it means to to be you know an electric utility. So that's kind of the focus in May uh, so I'll give you the date or Tracy will send you the date as we get closer if everybody wants anybody wants to go mm -hmm. you just it's just at the select board meeting that's where you're yeah. yeah so I talk to the manager first and what happens is I'll show him like here's the topics I'm going to discuss and he can add things change things whatever and then I'll produce mm -hmm. the slides and then in May I'll go in and we'll do the slides. and they requested it or did well, you just I usually it? go to okay. the town like right. once or twice a year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Vanessa asked uh, for one. We just did one in in November for the town meeting, yes. so I would have waited a little longer, but this is fine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think it's good to have board representation there. You know, just for continuity. I agree. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for volunteering. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tom. <laughs> just wanted to go back real quick to something you mentioned about yeah, green communities. <laughs> <laughs> So Reading is not a, a designated green community, correct? Correct. So I was just looking at what, what it is, what a green community, what that means. So it might be worth just mentioning what it means. It's, it's a designation um, for, it, it means that this, the municipality can get financial and technical support if the municipality pledges to cut municipal energy use by 20% over five years. 
and meet some other criteria. So more than half of the municipalities in the state are in this and, and two thirds of the state's population. And um, from what we're hearing, Reading is not. We have to look yeah. more into whether or not the town of Reading has access to those monies when they don't contribute through their electric company. So there's, there's some more conversation that maybe we can have offline that, okay. that Chuck's is evaluating right now. Um, because we're not, they're, the town of Reading's not paying into it. Yep. So the money would goes through, can go through that way. We just want to make sure that we're we're. Oh, some of the other communities Dave's talking about are their towns are paying into it. They're paying? separately. The towns are paying something. No, the electric it's going. Their through utility the is right. okay. Oh, this just says that these are municipalities who have pledged to cut municipal energy use by twenty oh, percent. Right, but I'm reading uh, off the state's do you website. Yeah. Chime in since you did some yeah. of the research. Those municipalities are, for the most part, situated in investor-owned utility service territories. Okay. Got it. it. Because there's a couple of hundred yes. municipalities in Massachusetts, only 41 yeah. of which yeah, right. are municipal light plants. Right. There are four, possibly five, municipal light plants, the smaller ones in western Massachusetts, that signed on for the Green Communities Program when it was initially launched. None of the others have signed up. Um, I have been speaking with the uh, executive director for Green Communities, as was mentioned uh, earlier. He is a resident in Linfield, and the Linfield town manager uh, connected us. Uh, he and I are looking at ways that we can uh, cooperate and work to the benefit of the four communities that we serve. One of the things that gives us access to their resources is if there is an investor-owned customer within the municipal service territory, obviously not served by the municipal electric system. We believe there are, there are a couple. We have some concerns about, as Colleen said, tapping into monies that we didn't raise. On the other hand, there are some REGI funds, Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative funds, and some of the VW uh, funds uh, that they have available that were not generated by ratepayers of investor-owned utilities and that we may be able to cooperatively uh, work to use to the benefit of the municipalities. So we would be working towards that goal. I would point out that uh, a 20% reduction over five years uh, becomes challenging if we're doing an electrification program where we are trying to uh, convert uh, gas consuming uh, vehicles in the transportation sector and uh, oil consuming uh, shells in the business, uh, in the buildings sector uh, for home and, and business heating uh, to uh, like, heat yeah. pumps competing so, so right. that yeah. that kind of puts some challenges yeah. uh, there it just but we are looking use, to work yeah. with the green communities it's it's a great it's a great thing to be doing so it's complicated it says energy use here so i don't know if that is only electric electricity it doesn't include it it is not only okay. electricity uh it's all fuels okay. uh, uh across all sectors but um that gets us also into managing non-electric usage in uh, town properties as well. So I would prefer to work uh, on a cooperative basis, look for joint ventures that we can do, joint investment opportunities. We put some in, they put some in, and the municipality uh, benefits uh, that much more. So mm. uh, we are working. Uh, well, it sounds like you have the right contact with the person that runs the whole thing in our service area and yeah. you're you're connected to them so yep. and in fact he and i uh exchanged another round of emails uh, just this afternoon so mm -hmm. great okay good. great great good all right are we going back to chuck now are you done with your part Something. all right back to you chuck okay <clears throat> even though we really never left you well mm. <laughs> This is the boring part of the evening where I tell you 
everything's going really well, nothing has changed, everything's on course, no bad news. Mm -hmm. Sorry. We like that. <laughs> Keep it boring. <laughs> so what you see up here is the differential in the um, budget to actual for power supply for January. And the reason that uh, actual is down is that January uh, weather was a little warmer than average. And as a result, uh, sales were down, load was down, we didn't purchase as much. So that's pretty much where that is. But again, um, it's easy enough to sit here and say, we're under budget. Mm -hmm. uh, as if it's a good thing. Yeah, <laughs> as, as if being 12% below right. expectations is a, is a good thing. So this is the energy piece component that we're looking at. And again, it's the same story. Energy is the biggest piece of it. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be the one that's most reflective of where the loads are. And since the, the price is relatively fixed under our uh, power supply agreements, um, what we're looking at is, is more energy uh, kilowatt hour driven than it is dollar driven, even though these are dollar values. Transmission cost, if the peaks are down, um, we don't pay as much for transmission. Um, but you'll notice that the gap is a lot closer on this than it was on the, on the energy one. And capacity costs um, don't change much because capacity cost is set in the summertime and we pay that uh, as a flat monthly rate. So the mm -hmm. variance there actually comes from ISO adjustments. So the, you would expect the capacity cost difference to be negligible. This is the stacking of the uh, resources. Uh, in our portfolio. Uh, yellow is market. That's the one that we want to call the most attention to because it has the potential to be the most volatile. Mm -hmm. uh, in the month of January, uh, the loads um, were less than the energy in the portfolio. And so you'll notice that the yellow is actually below the zero line. That means that we were net sellers uh, into mm -hmm. the market. What, what, what about November and December and? I did those already. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Like I said, I'm You're sorry. You're gonna fill this I, out as we go along, aren't you? I'm just boring. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Wait, do you see February? <laughs> right. No change. <laughs> All right. Good. And you have a. Um, we have a motion too on. Um, we will. Is that up on the agenda next? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is actually interesting and fun. Um, we have the opportunity to buy an additional 3% of our load uh, from a hydro resource that is dispatchable. There are two uh, plants um, in Connecticut that will be delivered to the Massachusetts hub. And those two plants have uh, ponding capability behind them. So they do have storage capability. They are dispatchable. Um, the contract price is $52 and change a megawatt hour. Uh, we are getting main recs uh, along with it. Uh, the price will be just north of $51 a megawatt hour uh, around the clock. Um, Energy price is between 45 and $50 a megawatt hour. Peak is 48 to 50. So we're very close to uh, the uh, marginal energy price in the market for a hydroelectric resource. Uh, so we will be able on our uh, AQ31 report to improve the non-carbon aspects of our portfolio. Uh, this is a 10-year deal that will start uh, April 1st if approved. Nice job. Good. Yeah. That's great. You want the motion? All right, so I'm going to read the motion. Uh, move that the RMLD Board of Commissioners 
authorize the general manager of the Reading Municipal Light Department to finalize negotiation and execute a contract with First Light Power Resources for the output of the Shupog, do I got that right, and Stevenson Hydroelectric Facilities. Second. 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 All right. Um, discussion? Any questions or comments? Uh, no? All those add, we should add that it's on the recommendation of the general manager at the end of that, the motion. Okay. On the recommendation, just the just recommendation question, of the general manager? Yep. Mean? And all those in favor? Uh, oh, I just want oh, to question. You do have a question. <coughs> yeah, have a question. Yeah. My question was, what does dispatchable mean? Dispatchable means that ISO can call for the unit to be on, and the unit will then start producing. Ah, okay. Um, so it's on demand, yeah. basically. Solar is non-dispatchable. It's available when right. the sun shines. Wind is non-dispatchable. It's available when the wind blows. A run-of-the-river hydro plant does not have uh, storage capacity uh, behind any uh, dam that it may have, and so uh, it's not dispatchable. Thank you. But a dispatchable unit, uh, that would include nuclear units, it would include uh, the Stony Brook units that, that we have entitlements in, um, and in this case... Uh, and, and out of curiosity, how long can it be dispatchable? I mean, the pond only lasts so long. The pond only lasts so long, that's why I said it's partially dispatchable <laughs> okay. okay during wet weather yeah. um, <laughs> well hydro is available as uh commissioner talbot pointed out uh on a seasonal basis uh august is a, is a very tight month uh for for right. hydro uh and they do have to meet uh some fish ladder uh requirements when they uh run the river there are minimum flow rates uh through there so we may not get a lot uh, of energy um and so it is available when it rains. Great. Yeah. But um, partially dispatchable means that we can usually use it against high energy cost periods of right. the day. We Perfect. don't have to let it run at 2 o'clock in the morning. Yep. Great. Thank you. Okay. I do have one oh, quick, yeah, quick follow-up. And this is it's not on you, Chuck, to, to answer, but I did just, was just looking more into this green communities thing. And as I understand it, it's the municipality is is the one who decides whether they want to go for this designation and then get access to the technical support and the funds and that this question of a, of a light plant municipality being different i'm sure there's something there i am reading that shrewsbury and hingham just did become green communities they they have municipal light plants and looking at the map there's a few others like um belmont and others that are municipal light plants where the community is a is a designated green community so I think it's a good question to bring back, you know, for the select board is, you know, what does the town think about gaining such a designation and how does that all work? And this seems like there's a lot of good stuff to look into there. So I just wanted to elaborate on what I saw as far as the municipal light plant angle, not precluding towns from being green communities. No, towns are not precluded. Yeah. And as I said at the outset, there are four or five municipalities in western Massachusetts with municipal light plants that that joined on the uh, initial startup we are evaluating based on where we are what our situation is and what green communities offers uh, what the uh, maximum advantage that we can get uh, for the municipalities is so but doesn't the town of Reading have to join up to, to doesn't that help if the town side does something I mean why is it just us doing it? I can yeah, it's okay. Can we, we can do I'm it. Just we can, can we just go back to like yeah. he's already been? Um, uh, I've already delegated yep. to him to do the analysis of this. So we okay. just started. So it's it's almost like it's early. Just a little early, right. but okay. At the That's next fair meeting, enough. We can, or even before the next meeting, I can send out a memo. Yep. And let you know what I found yep. before. Um, yeah, Before and you I have. Tell you yeah. how those ones you just mentioned got in there. Sure. Yeah, and and it's also, but I'm only, I'm, I'm actually not. It's not on, on, on you guys. It's more like I'm, I'm saying this from the DS because I think it's something with the town side. If, if we're not in this now, and I just wonder why, as not the light plant, but the town. That's all. The towns need to have an IOU uh, customer in their service territory uh, now to be able to join there is a loophole in the legislation uh, we now have uh, identified 
one or more grid customers in our service territory, and they're talking about all four towns uh, in. Uh, okay. As usual, I'm, a, I'm ahead of uh, what I know. Mm-hmm. You know, my mouth runs ahead of <laughs> what's in my brain. It's a loophole. It I'm happens. Not, I'm not a big fan of loopholes, so we just want to make sure that okay. we understand it before we approach the town. Can we finish? We, the I, we're in the middle of a motion here. Yes, I, 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 you're right, vote. John. I lost I control. Thought, I thought we were As a right. chair, I, we were, did, we were in the discussion control. phase of a motion, <laughs> Sorry, and I you kind of took us on another discussion, <laughs> and I let you do it. And uh, So now we're going to vote. All we're those in favor of that motion that we were talking about. All right, five zero zero. And Tracy, is are we voting on the Energy New England one now too? So Chuck is going to give us. Okay. No, like on item C here. Are we doing this now? Okay. Yeah, we're done with that one, right? I don't think Dave, yeah, I think Dave's oh. not talking meeting minutes. You're talking something else, aren't you? Uh, right. It says Energy New England right. attachment three. three. Right. Right. So that would be um, the minutes that I sent you. Okay, so it is the minutes. Sorry, there shouldn't have been the attachment there. Okay. Oh, okay. All right, so this is just a motion to approve the minutes. Okay. So All right, do we have a motion, Phil, on this? So we're knocking out January 24th, 2019. Don't read that one. Okay. Okay. That's because somebody didn't re- review the minutes. We'll leave, leave that person alone. <laughs> okay. Move that the Board of Commissioners approve the executive session minutes of September 20, 2018, October 18, 2018, and February 13, 2019, on the recommendation of the general manager. All right. Second. 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 Discussion. All those in favor? All right. Five zero zero. Excellent. What I do? Oh yes, I vote yes. Okay. Okay. Five zero zero. In favor of releasing the minutes as That's described right. in the motion, right. as seconded. <laughs> I, maybe you were waiting to <laughs> take the discussion. I just wanted to think about it another minute. Okay. Okay. These minutes Chuck are another very question important. during the discussion of approving the minutes. <laughs> All right. Good, Chuck. I think you're you've done your thing, right? You're good. I thought I did my thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your research and your work on that and on this other thing. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we have Wendy coming up with some finance reporting. And while she's coming up, I'll make a note that uh, Karen Herrick is here from the Finance Committee. Good to have you. Hi, Thanks Karen. for coming, Karen. Welcome, Karen. We're happy for, uh, to get any comments or questions for you along the way. So chime in. What fiscal year are we in? <laughs> <laughs> I am going to go over that as a reminder. Thank you. Thank you. All right, good evening. good evening. So I would like to start with a reminder that we have just closed the six month uh, transition period for the gap of six months transitioning from fiscal year June 30 into now calendar year 1231. So we do no more six this months. Is, we're done with that. This is our. This and is now we're going to do full twelve months from now on. Twelve months from now on, uh, starting January first through December thirty first, nineteen. All Excellent. right. Okay. Mm-hmm. So with that being said, these financials can be um, misleading. Just so you know that. So as you know, everything we do on a budget cycle is for twelve months, and when you try to simply divide that when you've done a full year cycle. Timing takes uh, a big a big play into that. Not only seasonal things, right, exactly. And, yeah, not right. only with sales, but expenses, projects right. that um, were supposed to be done with certain weather conditions, maybe didn't get done on time. Just want to remind you of that. Okay. Okay. So I just want to tell you too that this is a draft because um, usually the auditors would uh, present our final financial um, information. But because uh, of the actuarial with the OPEB and the pension, uh, new GASB laws, it seems to be holding everything up. And I didn't want to hold you guys up. So this is a draft, and it very well could change, especially in relation to pension and OPEB. Uh, Outside of that, there should be no changes. Okay? Okay. Mm -hmm. So the auditors were on site uh, the week of March 4th. Um, It was a week that we had some snow, so it wasn't as quick and easy as we had hoped, but 
you know, they came in, they did a great job as always. Uh, they're still doing a lot of behind the scenes stuff. We have some things we need to finalize, um, reporting and whatnot. So, but it's still ongoing and we're, we're shooting maybe for a May presentation. Just so you know. So my first, um, first slide is what I love, a pie chart. And it just gives you a quick uh, overall look of the cash balances. So if you quickly look, uh, you'll see that the operating fund is at 18.3 million. Combined depreciation fund and the construction fund are at 10 million, and that's in preparation for our upcoming project, uh, capital projects for 2019. And then you have your sick leave um, cash that's restricted for the sick leave liability that has come down to $2.9 million. And then, you, of course, you have your pension trust at $5.8 million. That's cash uh, that we have for the pension. Your customer, depo customer deposits, uh, hazardous waste, and uncollectible accounts. And then you have your um, deferred ECC reserve, so we can only use that for uh, energy conservation projects. And, of course, we have the uh, rate stabilization fund, which is to supplement a burden uh, on our customers in case of an emergency at $7 million. So we'll go to the next slide. So here it is. This is where I was talking about the timing of things. So it appears that we are under budget at this moment in time for the six months ended 1231 of about $800,000. And uh, there, there are many components to that. Once again, let's not forget we have many vacancies uh, that we're trying very hard to fill. And the timing of projects, there are that's really the, the bulk of it. And then when you go to the last slide, uh, I think you guys like this slide, so I, I bring it up every so often. It shows how uh, we continue to reinvest in our capital infrastructure. So um, not only are we taking our net income or our rate of return, but we're adding more. We're, we're adding more uh, from from what we're allowed from the depreciation fund. So if you look at it, just starting in FY14 uh, all the way through FY18, those are your full years. So if you look at the red, the red depicts the depreciation. So that's what we are, that's what's reserved specifically for capital projects. And if, uh, with the exception of FY15, every year we have gone beyond um, the depreciation fund in order to um, update our capital infrastructure because the updates were not there. So I, I know you guys like this uh, slide, so I'd like to continue to show you uh, how much we continue to invest in the uh, capital side of things to, for the safety and reliability of our infrastructure. So on those slides in particular, do we have any questions? No. Okay, yeah, so. There's a lot of things moving around, so. Yes. So I just want to um, just, I, I gave you the financials in front of you. I didn't want to spend a lot of time on them, but I just wanted to point, uh, point them out to you that, um, you know, everything's in good order. But like I said, the timing of things. As we see this increase, we quickly turn around in January and February, and we see almost similar of a decrease. Mm -hmm. Because as Chuck mentioned, the months uh, were not as cold as we expected. So it's really going to flip-flop real quickly, but it's but it's going to be you know within the new within the new calendar year. So it's not going to be reflective of these numbers. So it's not like it's going to be carried forward. Um, so we're ending up with a loss at the beginning of 2019, even though we ended up with a positive results at the end of 2018. So is there anything in particular that you wanted to go over? No. Yes, Tom. Just a question, yep. uh, Tom. if you have it, so. You know, we've been kind of trying to keep an eye on operating revenues, and I know a lot of you're in the midst of this transition in yes. fiscal years, but do you have any sense of, um, you know, if we just look at first quarter, I know March is still in process, but, you know, is there a trend line? Is it up or down or flat or it, As uh, January, well, since we're in March, we can't really, uh, right, we can't determine that, but January and February alone, we're at about a 3.5 uh, percent loss in kilowatt hour sales. Yeah. So it's yeah. actually accelerated yeah. from uh, yes. before. Jeez. Is that a year to like January, February year to date? Is Just January and February together, yes. 3.5 percent down? Down, yes. 
just because of the weather, yeah, you know, warmer, uh, in particular. Yeah. And how oh. would, I don't know if you'd be able to answer this, but how would that compare traditionally to uh, January, February, you know, in previous years? Is, do we usually have a negative and then we... Well, typically, typically we have our, um, and maybe Colleen would like to speak to this or check, but typically we do certain six months are higher and then the other six months are lower. So uh, this past six months, the fall, it was, if you remember, the weather was um, warm. Well, we had the July, August, September, where we had some warm weather. Uh, so that really is what increased the sales. You, you really can't predict it, right? Yeah. Uh, typically, that's, those are the hotter months. So that's why this is very misleading, because we end our fiscal year on June 30, and in this case, you know, we don't have the full 12-month look. Does that answer your question, Tom? Yep. Okay, good. Yep. I thought you were saying it was 3.5% down, just comparing it to January and February of last year. Yes, I am. Yeah. Okay. Yes, All right. that's exactly what I said. All right, yeah. thanks. Looks yeah. pretty yeah. substantial. Yeah. It is. Yeah, so I, I don't know how the other commissioners feel. I, I think that's such an important metric for us, maybe uh, to the extent, and I know you can't project some of the months till you close, but in any 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 guidance you can give us just so we 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 have I mean, we have the historical but just like you just said knowing yes. how the year-to-date numbers look is, is helpful so we're, we're uh, it's gonna be very difficult this year I just want to let you know that to uh, compare year to year because now you're comparing a difference even though you're comparing 12 months overall with this being said you know the first six months are hotter than the last six months um, it's it's gonna be hard to compare numbers so and even the auditors, they will not give us um, in, um, comparable financial statements for that right. point. Right. Because, it, you know, even when you're trying to get projects done before the fiscal year ends and you're trying to meet deadlines, you know, your whole year changes. So it, all of that changes. And I know you don't, you don't necessarily like to hear the timing, cause it's not, but it's not really an excuse. It's the fact. Yeah. But to, to repeat what you said, the, obviously the hotter months would should reflect higher operating revenues, right? Yes. Right. Yeah. Do we think that um, the three and a half percent down off of February, January, February of last year, that three and a half percent is that mostly due to weather, or is it half, or you think it's you think all of it's weather? Or is it yeah? Because we were talking about our revenues dropping yeah. about one or two percent per year. I'm just wondering if it's equally yeah. is that equally contributing to this down to trend? Yeah. I think that would be. Weather is significant, okay. but I think we can give Chuck an opportunity, maybe not at this meeting, to look at the, you know, the reduction per class. And if you look at the reduction per right. class of use, you can kind of weed out what was weather and what we've had for uh, whether or not there's a pattern in the right. classes. You know what yeah. I mean? Because even though if the weather goes down, all the classes go down, but you might be able to get a little bit more analysis. Might be able to tease out what the real difference exactly. was. Right. Okay. That would be good to know. Because that would be, if it wasn't mostly weather, that would be yeah. very no, it's important information. I think that statistical analysis would be very interesting. Maybe going back 10 years or so, Chuck, something like that. A <laughs> <laughs> hundred. Dennis, you have a question. Well, a comment. Um, for the town of Wilmington, what I do is I... Um, I've, I have a trend of all my utility costs, whether it's RMLD or uh, fuel, but I also trend weather. And I look at the last, from 2013 to now, and it looks like, oh, I've done this great job saving money. But if you look at the weather at the same time, you can really see weather drives my savings. Yeah. Yeah. The, plus our yeah. energy conservation. But when you trend weather to expenses, sometimes you really see yeah. where that's coming from. Right. And you look at a three to five year window, that really helps you understand that, you know, you had a couple cold years and right. you're right around where those are. Last, this year here was off, and that could be your skew. So you, you think it's probably this 3.5% is mostly weather? It could be, yeah. but that's, what you, that's why you trend both. Right. You, know, you get, keep a metric on both so that way you, you can see how it affects you. The difficulty is that uh, warm weather is great, right, I mean, in terms of how we feel about it up to a certain point. When it gets too warm, you turn on your air conditioner. Mm. and that drives our sales. So up to a certain point, we're dropping because the war winters are warmer, right. but the summers are hotter, it kind of balances So my costs out. are going up, but I'm also showing my trend of the weather doing right. the same thing. Right. So I'm still saving money, but uh, the weather is driving my yeah. end result. So right. I'm sure there's a correlation. Yeah, Yeah. thanks for the comment, yeah. Dennis. 
Yeah, so I mean, for me, the the real value of the whole discussion is to is to track the. I mean, the other thing is we've been tracking kind of flattening to slightly declining. So right. we, what we have to sort of the analysis piece is at some point if the weather continues <laughs> changes long enough that we have to assume that's the model, right? <laughs> so yeah. we have got to just figure out how we address the weather. As Absolutely. Because yep. what I don't think what we've seen is a an offsetting weather pattern that says, gee, you know, we, we're down three, but we were just up 10%, you know, mm -hmm. weather related. So it's really what tracking the sales variance to, to, to both budget and last year, but then also what's if we can explain the variance. And some of the explanation, of course, is we're doing a good job with solar and, and a lot of other cost savings things. So Efficiencies, it's a, yeah. It's, it's that efficiency piece. Nonetheless, and then the other piece is what are, we, are, the, what are the offsets that may not be uh, experienced yet they're doing all the initiatives, you know, Colleen, that you have that are driving with the team, you know, that may not happen now, but we, have, we can look to the future and say, okay, we're down to 2 or 3%, but economic development, you know, solar, right. battery, you know, that kind of thing. Right. Good. Dave, did you have something? No, okay. Anybody else? No. Okay. Yeah. Good. Thank you. My presentation. Oh, thank, thank you, Wendy. Thank that was you. good. Do we have a question? Oh, yes. Absolutely. Should you come up, Karen? Yep. Sure. Please. Right over the mic, oh, Karen. The mic, so we, yeah. we want to get you on TV and everything. <laughs> Say hi to the family if you like. Right. I am new. Thank Welcome, you. Karen. Thank you. Love that the lights are on. It's awesome. <laughs> Quick question. I was wondering for your capital plan, um, um, I see it does vary year to year, and I was just curious as to FY19, what is the number you think? Um, are you aiming for five million? Oh, so FY19 is, is over. So um, it was originally supposed to end in June 30, but we transitioned to 1231. So FY19 gotcha. is over, so gotcha. that those are the final numbers. Okay. Just for the six months. So. Okay, so I was just wondering for whatever 12 month period it is, will capital be significantly lower than $6 million or? Uh, significantly so higher. Oh, it's going to be a lot higher. Yes, so what it will, will it be, be roughly? I don't have my budget in front of me. Oh, wait, maybe I do. Maybe just, just like, yeah, roughly we're looking at um, about 9.3 million. Okay, thanks. Just curious. Sure. All right. Um, so cash rate stabilization right. funds. I was just wondering, um, and, and my experience has been with um, Redding and our use of that for sewer and water. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering how often does RMLD actually have to dip into the cash rate, cash rate stabilization fund? Well, I've been here uh, almost eight years and we have not. Right. Okay. okay. In, in my 33 years, I think there's been at least maybe seven or eight times. Okay. Right. But not recently. Not, not recently. recently. Okay. No. But if you no. don't have it, right. you're really in trouble. It, you know. Right. Yeah. No, I didn't know if this was a situation where it was like critical dependency. Mm -hmm. it's like it's there if you need it. So I, I think it's easy for someone to look at it and go, it's sort of a piggy bank that we kind of have there. Yeah. And the answer is it is not. Yeah. Right. So as, uh, can I just explain? It also means that like everything is being Everything's under control and being well managed. It's right. there for right. So, Can I just that. explain one thing quickly? Uh, uh, Colleen has mentioned this in the past, um, and Hamid, if there were a catastrophic event uh, of loss of a substation, it would most likely cost us anywhere between um, eight and nine million dollars just right. to exactly. keep things running while we mm -hmm. are rebuilding a substation. That's right. So we wouldn't want to pass that off to our customers as a burden. Right. So that is a situation where we would uh, dip into that. And that's the worst catastrophic thing you guys could come up with, and that's roughly the. It's, the it's worst one of them. One a of loss of a major customer, coincident, multiple customers. Uh, this we have a. That no you'd get advance notice. I mean, but you. We hope. Yeah. yeah well, probably. Yeah. Um, if they got washed away. Yeah, probably the loss of a substation. Uh, pretty significant. It's a good example. Okay. Hurricane. Uh, Hurricane. Thank yeah. You. Right. Um. I was curious um, in this uh, municipal uh, statement of revenues. 
Yes. The yes. legal fees were a uh, lot, significantly more. Was that an unusual um, thing? Uh, no, there, there's actually um, some power um, legal issues with FERC, and maybe Chuck or Colleen would like to speak to that. And that's really where the majority of the um, additions are. Legal fees. The legal fees, the uh, additional for power supply, the, the lawsuits. We, we've power. had, I can have Chuck, we, we've had, this industry, we have a lot of uh, uh, legal battles with FERC implemented changes where because we support the little guy, we have to hire lawyers aggregately with the other 41 municipals and we fight. So Chuck can give you a couple of examples. Uh, legal fees go up, but then usually, m most often, we'll get a, um, you know, it'll, it'll get settled and we'll get money back. You know what I mean? But the legal battle up front is, is very costly, but I can limit, get, let him give you an example. If I could, uh, Karen. Um, I know you're going through a number of different items. Could I suggest that you do this offline rather than for some of the efficiency? Okay, fine. I'm, I'm just because it's the efficiency of our process that here was to get through. percent increase. So I was just asking whether that was an anomaly. That's really all I'm asking. Thank you. Do you want me to raise? Yeah. Okay. That's all. Yep. Okay. Are you gonna, he's going to give you an example of one, so that you better understand it. Okay. The large item that you're referring to was an unanticipated uh, litigation before FERC where we were trying to keep Mystic 8 and 9 uh, up and running. Uh, it resulted in about a $250,000 yeah. legal expense over a short term. However, the affirmation of the running of the plant uh, will save RMLD a little over $2 million a year for a couple of years beginning in 2023. So uh, it, it's going to be a deferred benefit. Okay. It's, it's an anomaly. That's yep. a, that was my yep. question. Uh, okay. Quick question. Fuel re under operating revenues. Fuel revenue. Is that the item on my bill that is like the fuel charge? Is that what that is? Yes, it is. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and just thank as you a for asking. Just we just like audience ask. participation. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you for coming. Stuff. Thanks, Karen. I have one final question. And, oh, Wendy, before you go, Tom has a question for yeah, you. So just a, a, another piece. So we're about 3.5% off uh, this year to last year, January, February, January, February. And what is it relative to budget? I can't remember what, where the budget was for those two months. So do you know what? I, I actually don't have that on top of my head. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, because I've just closed December. For January, we just had a financial. financial. I'm sorry, Tom. Year. I can uh, email you and let you know. Okay. okay. Yeah. Right. I think that would just be you know, mm -hmm. helpful. Good. Thank you, Wendy. Thanks, Wendy. Thank I think you. we're good. And um, Hamid. Oh, okay, so oh, Chuck, oh, Chuck. Yeah. Were you asking about January? Well, that was the first. Both, but January, whatever we have for year budget versus actual for 2019. Yeah. Yeah. That was the first slide that I had up this evening. I don't know if Wendy can get back to it. He was talking about uh, kilowatt hour sales. Uh, yeah, they're going to be down about the the same proportion. Okay. So. Let it be. Yeah. So I guess I, I can get question. you the actual is on the, that. Uh, is the operating revenues for 20? I, I know we're in the fiscal year, but I'm just wondering: Are we sort of budgeting a flat year uh, for operating revenues? We looked at it on a calendar. Yes. Year, yes. Kind of. Okay. Good. We can have we can have Wendy revisit the budget to actual so far with your forecasted for the entire year if you'd like to do that next. Have that as a presentation for next yeah. meeting. Sure, mm -hmm. that sounds that? good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that'd be. Mm -hmm. Would that be yeah, helpful? That'd be fine. Yes. I think yeah. so. Yep, yeah. yeah. sounds fine. Yep. Yeah. All right, Hamid. Good Welcome. Evening. Good, good evening. evening. I'm glad to give you a report for the. Well, actually, my uh, my report is current. And we're glad to receive your report mm -hmm. as well. <laughs> In a new format. I've I'm noticed. the big spender. Yeah, look at you. You're changing <laughs> up the slides every month on us now. You're really getting slides. creative, Hamid. Yeah. yeah, trying to add Where do you some get pictures these? so to give you just some sense of what's going on. So yeah. That, you know, Where do you get these templates? The money, you know. All right, the first project, uh, these are the major construction projects that, uh, that they're either underway or they're recently completed. The 4W5, 4W12, getaway improvements, and Station 4. This is the capital authorization projects that we're trying to uh, increase the ratings of underground cable so the feeders, they can uh, carry more capacity. And we got the cable trays, and these two circuits are being pulled out of the underground, and they 
going to making a transition to the overhead so they will open up more room for the heat exchange and improving the ratings of uh, uh, the f rest of the feeders c coming out of that substation. So this project is moving right along uh, with the both overhead and also the work that needs to be done inside the station. The next one is 3W13 riser. This pole, uh, this riser out on Chestnut Street, <coughs> outside of Station 3, was uh, hit by a motor vehicle and, and uh, it got damaged, severely damaged. So that was repaired and we, uh, we transferred everything back to the riser, uh, brought it back to normal configuration. Uh, 5W5 Andover Access uh, Road upgrade, that's a capital project. That included upgrading five poles uh, uh, between Andover Street and Salem Street in Wilmington. And those poles, they were replaced and uh, overhead wires, they were upgraded. So they matched the rest of the feeders uh, for the ratings. The next one is, I think you would like to see that. Actually, I was there yesterday. Uh, station three, the battery storage, it's mm -hmm. uh, gone. The uh, excavation, the ground excavation started. So they're making progress. What we've done, we provided them two poles, transformer, and the secondary wires. So uh, they're ready to uh, pick up their uh, service for the auxiliary service of the battery storage. So as soon as they pull the cables, uh, the, the contractor is pulling the cables uh, to service the auxiliary system, uh, we can hook them up. So we are ready So for them as soon as they're ready. So that project is in progress. Uh, station 4, 4W6, and 4W16, getaway replacements. That's, again, a, another capital improvement project. The cables are uh, in our stock, ready. We're waiting just for warmer weather so we can pump the manholes, uh, uh, pump the water out, and uh, replace those getaways, again, to improve the ratings of the underground cables for the reliability. The next one is the area upgrade projects. Again, uh, the secondary main and services that include upgrading primary wires, open uh, wire uh, s service wires, secondaries, the transformers. And uh, uh, what we did, in the, we did one of the biggest uh, uh, area in North Reading, that Burdett Road in North Reading, that was completed. We upgraded the poles, primaries, secondaries, wires, and that area now is, uh, was, that was one of the uh, areas that we were concerned with the reliability, and then now everything is reconstructed and uh, working well. Uh, the underground facility upgrade, uh, we completed gazebo circles and in Reading, uh, we replaced another, the last transformer on uh, Moran Road in Linfield, the one pad, one transformer was replaced and crews are in the process of replacing the underground cable as we, you know, speak. Uh, so, Friendship Lane also in Linfield, they upgraded the, the transformer and uh, underground uh, cable that it's in progress. It's a little bit longer process for that. Uh, so these are the improvements to uh, URDs underground areas. The next slide uh, showing you the maintenance program basically I'm not going to go over all of those but we're making good progress on the maintenance of the transformers as well as the overhead. We've re replaced lots of underground transformers as you could see from the original list that I gave you back in 2015. So the, as you know this is the moving target so we mm -hmm. are trying right. to catch up Anything over 20 to 25 years old, we, uh, we have a list. We've got like about 1,800 transformers in that category. And we're conducting another study just to see where we are and we are continuously improving the processes. And actually we could manage to kind of uh, uh, not completely put the uh, oil leak uh, to stop because we still got old transformers out there, but at least to bring it to manageable level. So, which is good, is a progress. Uh, the pole testing and inspections, uh, that's one of my favorite programs, and uh, we tested 259 poles and we uh, basically transferred 231. The feeder inspection, that's routinely, that's what the guys, they do really on rainy days. They patrol the areas. The infrared scan, we uh, scan the substations as well as the parks quarterly, substations every month quarterly for the parks, no problems. We 
to find in any of those. Uh, manhole inspection and porcelain and cutout replacement are ongoing as we go into uh, to the improvements, making improvements in uh, the areas both overhead and underground. So we are uh, making those uh, upgrades as well. Uh, the next slide shows the double poles, as you could see, the lint field, uh, we've got 30 transfers to do, in Reading, 30 transfers, 18 pole butts that need to be uh, removed. North Reading, we've got three transfers and 20 pole butts that we need to remove. And in Wilmington, uh, we, need, we, we need to make 28 transfers and uh, one pole butt that needs to be removed out of the area. As you recall, uh, North Reading and half the Reading is uh, uh, RMLD's uh, custodial area. Right. And the other uh, areas, town, towns, are Bryce's. Yeah. So we're making progress on transferring those double poles. Uh, but uh, that shows <coughs> improvements we, uh, we're making throughout the system. So these numbers, again, these are moving targets up and down, up and down. Uh, the next slide shows the reliability indices that we are well below. Uh, even though we had few storms this year and we, we, uh, we didn't have much outages, uh, we did really well reliability-wise, and the numbers basically they show that, they reflect that. The safety, KD, and safety are well below the national and regional averages. So reliability, we're doing good. Uh, the last slide basically showing you the causes of the outages in, uh, as of February 2019. As, uh, as you can see, again, we are doing well below the five years average, but this is only uh, two months uh, comparison. Uh, and more vehicle accidents, I'm hoping that this is going down because this has been over already, um, more, uh, has contributed uh, to the outages significantly. Uh, We've had few, 11 of those, la you know, last year we had, and it was really uh, made some serious damages. Uh, the 3W3 riser out, out on Chestnut Street. Really? A, a week. Wow. To, you know, to d fix that. Mm. Huh. Uh, so Do we need to put on bigger poles or well, unless <laughs> if you put sandbags rails, around the front? Or or uh, <laughs> <laughs> guard rails. <laughs> guard rails, maybe, yeah. yeah. Jersey barriers, those are the only way that, you know. Actually, right. the snow banks, you know, they have. Yeah, yeah, snow banks, sure. They protect our homes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, all right, so I'm done. If you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer. Questions for Hamid? Great. Dennis? Nope, I'm good, thanks. Okay, yeah. all right. I guess you want to buy some things, Hamid, oh, today? Oh, yeah. I'm always buying. Okay. You want the motion? Yes, maybe we'll all start right. a motion, then you can give us the. Right. Move that bid 2019-9 for one Class V fork truck with 12,000-pound load capacity be awarded to Northland Industrial Truck, Co truck Company, Inc. as the lowest and most responsible bidder for $60,500 pursuant to Mass General Laws Chapter 30B on the recommendation of the General Manager. Second. Second. All right. And background. All right, you see that, you know, there are two bidders that participated. The lowest bidder was $51,273. That's uh, the Endless Sales Incorporation. And uh, they did not, they took exception because we had requested for a, a limited, uh, for the limited free lift work truck, for truck. And they gave us the full, which means this is basically those big cylinders that, you know, they right in front of the fork truck and they obstacle, they, they, they are obstacle to actually the movement of the truck uh, because we needed to uh, move stuff inside the uh, storage area. Mm. And we needed the ones, those tanks to be in the back so they're not uh, you know, blocking the view. So uh, this one, uh, the we had to award a bit to the next uh, Lowest responsible, lowest responsible, responsive bill for sixty thousand five hundred dollars. Okay. They want. Questions or discussion for Hamid? Yeah. yeah. I mean, how, how many total bids came in? Two. Two. Is there any reason? I would have thought on an item like forklift would get more. It just. Uh, they sent the bid to all of these. As you see on the front, uh, one, two. Three. These are uh, six, eight, eight companies, eight vendors, basically. Yeah. Some people, for different reasons, they don't, you know, yeah. 
I, we see that quite often for transformers as well. We send like 20 or 30 uh, vendors. Or is there something special? Special this about this? Is, this is no. This is pretty much the people should have. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and mm. this is something that they have. So in this mm. particular one, only two decided to uh, participate, and it happens. So Thank it's you. been advertised, everybody knows about it, and yeah. we actually send the bid to these people too. And for one reason or another, they decide not to participate, or maybe okay. the timing is not good. Any other questions or discussion? All those in favor? Motion carries 500. All right, next. Oh, yes, go ahead. Move the proposal IFP 2019 10 for uh, pole mounted transformers be awarded to Graybar Electric Company Inc. for a total of 68,224, I'm assuming that should be. Pursuant it looks like there may be a typo there. Yeah. Uh, yeah I don't know what $224. 224, there's just a, a one instead of a, a, comma. a decimal point, probably. We have, we're gonna pay an extra dime, I guess, maybe. Okay. Pursuant to Mass General Laws, Chapter 164, Section 56D on the recommendation of the general manager. Second. Second. Okay. And just so that that is the right number, then, Tracy, it's six hundred and sixty-eight thousand two hundred twenty-four. All right. Sorry. Well, no. Well, um, well, she's conf. Okay. Great. Yeah, that's right. And uh, discussion background. Okay, these are the uh, pole top transformers. The next two beds basically are pole top tra transformers and uh, pad mount transformers that we use for new business or workers for both uh, commercial residentials as well as our transformer load management program that we uh, annually we go up to bid and these bids actually they came out lower than the last time so we're saving some money you know it's amazing the timing makes a big difference and this time around you know we made out really we, there, there were some savings so i have some more money left that we're gonna go for more transformers the next time excellent Okay. Uh, discussion or questions for me? Uh, I, I Go ahead. This is more a general question on, on items like this, Amit, and, and this doesn't affect voting on this item, but right. uh, are there items that of this size, uh, dollars, are there any opportunities to have like longer term blanket orders? So in other words, we must go through a lot of transformer stuff. So rather than spending, you know, 300,000 or half a million this year, if we commit to a longer period and have them in releases because we you kind of know maybe not where you're going to need it but you could probably estimate pretty quickly i just wonder if there's an opportunity there we did that with the switches with those uh, uh smart uh, smart grid switches yeah we did that like a blanket five year you know and actually we yeah that's what did i'm did quite savings we did with the transformers to be honest with you we haven't done that and I'm not sure that, you know, because the price of the metal keeps going, it's volatile mar market goes up and down, up and down. So I'm not sure how that works. I, I don't know anybody who's done that, but I can find out to see that, you know, if that's yeah, possible that we could okay. do that. Yeah, we used to go, if you recall, twice a year, yeah. or sometimes three times a year, depending on the need and the inventory. But this time around, we decided to go for the, you know, for the, uh, I might have to come back for more because I got more money l left. We thought that th th it's gonna all going to be spent uh, by this bid, but they came out lower. So, uh, but usually if we try to go once a year, so and the, the delivery is going to be staggered, you know. So like we, so we don't pay any storage storage fees. If I may, just a quick question. I thought at one point there was a supply side issue with transformers. It was difficult to yeah, because of the storms them. and all of the everything that was going south for the you know. The areas that they got hit the hurricanes and right. yeah. so yeah. my concern would be I mean we could certainly investigate it but whether they go on allocation you know for if it's a major storms coming through the United States giant hurricanes or whatever all you of might a sudden not the have access exactly yeah. the entire East Coast goes right. we all need transformers at the same time one benefit that this way it has if we give them a uh, you know uh, heads up and actually we give them a good uh, and we, we give them uh, we go out to bed annually that gives them ample time for manufacturing and scheduling. It all, all got to do with that too. 
Mm. But to John's point, though, under you know emergencies, I would think that would be that out up. the window. The prices should go up until the emergency. Yeah. Yeah, but the same thing. But even the supply, wouldn't they? Even though they've committed to us in an emergency, wouldn't they say, "No, we're going to move this to where the yeah, emergency if areas are"? Power was totally out in yeah, certain yeah. states. I would think that they would just. If it, it, it has happened, yes, yeah. I've seen that happening. That but actually, we had last year. We had these uh, trailer, trailer switches, five month switches. The manufacturer, because of the problems that they had in Midwest and also down to Florida, they shipped them. And yeah. the delivery, our delivery was postponed for almost a year. John, your question is like maybe we should not be so just in time and have a few. I don't know. I think maybe, uh, maybe we we're should, not. Maybe we, we should have plenty of reserve. I don't I mean, you know, part of that, I mean, I've got clients who have, uh, because of the whole trade issues that we're going through, they can't get semiconductors. That are crucial parts of their power inverter systems uh, because they're they're actually packaged in China. They're made in the United States and just packaged in China, but they can't get them because of all the trade stuff that's going on. And so they're under severe allocation for being able to get any of these parts. So I don't know if transformers fall into that same category. Maybe not. But uh, this this whole allocation thing is. Uh, I know some of the transformers they used to be manufactured in Mexico and Canada. But now they're mostly they're being manufactured in the U.S. But, but you know, I think the, the point is, if if there's a severe crisis, whether you have a blanket order or you're just ordering it today for next month, you're not going to get it. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, yeah. right. But that doesn't impact your. Well, that suggests we should have an inventory. We probably have an inventory of some sort, don't we? Yes, we do have. We check yeah. inventory. Yeah, that's another. I mean, my my original thought was around just negotiating the price, let them carry the inventory so we don't end up you know, right. with storage costs yeah. and things like that. But well, that, to your point, though, uh, Tom, I mean, if you go with a sole source supplier, which we may not be able to do anyway just because we have to put out for bid, mm -hmm. um, you know, they may give you a significant break because you're using them sole yeah. source, right? Yeah, that's mm. thing. Yeah. All right. I think we got enough. Are we good yep. on this one? Yep. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Okay. Motion carries five zero zero. All right. Motion and our last item. Move the proposal IFP two thousand nineteen dash eleven for pole mounted transformers be awarded to Wesco distrib distribution. Pad mounted. Pad mounted. Yeah. Didn't I say pad mounted? I think you said pole mounted. Pole mounted. Yeah, pole -mounted. maybe. Close enough. What do you want? Pole or do you want me to read this? Pad. <laughs> <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> Westco Distribution Inc. for two hundred and six thousand seven fifty five, and Howard Industries Inc. Care of Power Sales Group Inc. for eighty seven thousand one hundred and twenty, for a total of two hundred ninety three thousand eight seventy five, pursuant to Mass General Laws Chapter one sixty four Section forty six D on the recommendation of the general manager. Fifty six D. Yep. All right. And second. Second. Okay. Now we're ready. Oh, no, we, right. did, we got the second. We got now go. <laughs> yeah. This is basically the same. These are the and, uh, pad mounted transformers. They were, the previous one was pole mounted. Oh, okay. Pad mounted. So we went to 15 uh, uh, distributors. And uh, we, gotta, we, we ana analyzed the prices and, you know, who's the lowest and who's the lowest, and also based on the spec, because they have to meet our uh, certain criteria based on the Department of Energy Efficiency uh, level. So it needs to, uh, it will be, it, it's being uh, uh, analyzed and then the, uh, the bid went to multiple distributors. That's what you, what, that's why you see that, you know, there are different Howards. You got power sales and also Wesco and they all didn't go to one because, you know, various ones, they supply different uh, size transformers. That need to spec. Okay. Okay. Any questions or comments? Discussion? Okay. All those Good. in favor? Motion carries five zero zero. Thank you, Hamid. Can we just Thank just you, one Hamid. item, Mr. Chairman? Oh yes. Before Hamid. Yes. We we uh, apparently we solved the problem of that pole that's in Wakefield. Yes. Yes. You got. I sent you. you sent I, me the I we followed up with the, the right. manager of engineering and operations. Right. And they visited. They decided to move the pole two feet. Uh, inside. Right. Is this the one where all the construction is going on? Where the well, no, this is, yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Hopkins, so Hopkins basically the, the background is that this was when the the night we attended with the with the select yes. board, there was an issue, issue 
on the 40B that's going in Wakefield, mm -hmm. and there was the residents in the, from Reading were complaining that there's a pole at the corner of Hopkins right. and South Street right. that gets hit all the time and knocked over. And so I asked the department to look into it. It turns out the pole is actually in Wakefield hmm. and belongs to the Wakefield Light Department, and there's been cooperation between the right. Light Department here in Reading and them to, to kind of solve the problem. Yes, they, were, so, they, they are doing yeah. it. Yeah. Well, that's so. good. Okay. That worked out good. Thanks, yep. Phil. Okay. Very good. Thanks, Amit. You are. Any other general discussion items to just, follow on, Phil? I just, yeah. I just have one item. Go ahead. And, and it's, uh, I noticed that the, the old, the, the former home, our former home on Haven Street. Uh, the former home of this Of this department, of this department, 25 Haven Street. I noticed that the, uh, the uh, pharmacy, Rite Aid, has moved out of there now, and it's become a vacant building. And I do hope that. You want to move back? <laughs> no, I don't want to move okay. back. I just hope is you know that that when somebody's going to go in there, okay. you know, and develop that place, you know, as, as chair of the, the task force that had transitioned that okay. to a commercial property, it's, it's a little discouraging to see that it see it yeah. vacant. You know, so this it used to be a supermarket, didn't it? Yeah. No, way back when. No, the supermarket was on the other side of the street. What was, was it, it before? Yeah. No, it was it was the light it was the home of the light department. No, but for, that was before. it a supermarket? Well, then it, it transitioned. It became ah. Brooks Pharmacy, okay. and then Brooks sold out to Rite Aid. And now the building is empty, and I guess the I guess Rite Aid has closed both their locations, and it's now going to be a Walgreens down off of Bolton Street, from what I now understand. Hmm. So, so you're hoping something else will go in there? This I hope is a, something a else. A public goes service in. announcement. I, from I hope Pacino. something else goes in there. As, 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 we need ideas, Bill. As the, That's right. as the chair of the, the transition group, you know, <laughs> it well, we discouraged me to see that place empty sure. after all the work we went to to get get it open. You know, so. all right, good. All Thank right. you for sharing that. Any other general discussion items from anybody else or Dennis? Um, no, okay, okay. So, uh, we just got to go over our board meetings. We have to move uh, Thursday, April 18th. And can you guys check your calendars and see if we can move that to the next week? Yeah, let's see. How does everybody look for the following Thursday? When is town meeting? When is it Thursday the yeah well, that's fine with me that'd be the twenty fifth right I don't know when town meeting is right I'm not sure you when think town it could be that I have a suspicion you may be on oh. a Thursday night could be a town meeting do you have that access to that Tracy yeah well what about um, well we could do Wednesday Wednesday the twenty fourth yeah I mean I don't have any problem with Wednesday the twenty fourth I can do Wednesday the twenty fourth because they don't do town meetings on Wednesdays right no they don't Mondays and Wednesdays Mondays and Thursdays. Okay. You're right. So good, good call, Phil. So 24th sounds like it works for everybody. Yep. April 24th. Uh, yeah. I mean, other than I, I would just say those of us on town meeting. I mean, that's a. It's a busy week. It's a three oh, night. Come on, come on, come on. Uh, yeah. said it's, civic it's after duty. Tax season. You civic care. duty. You know. What day is it? The 20. Well, can we go to the following week, or is it too late? Yeah, it's too late. Is the 30th too late, the Tuesday? Too late. We have to have it in the month. Right. Is that right? Well, we could skip the we month have completely. To. Well, let me put it... Uh, yeah. yeah, right. There might be time-sensitive yeah, I mean, stuff. It look like I'm open. It's just... Uh, go with the 24th. Just... Ignore Tom's concern. Yes. Still saying yeah. just go with right. 24th. Just go with it. Let's do that. The heck with you. <laughs> 24th it is. Yep. Phil, Phil made that decision, <laughs> not me. Yep. I'll drive you, Phil. Okay. That's <laughs> all right. Yeah. All right, we'll go with the 24th. And then we want to communicate that to the, the cab to see if they want to go on that, if it works for you guys. Yeah. yeah. So we're going to see if all the members are available. That way the liaison for both sides. We'll yeah, it works really night. easy. It really works, and it, and it really works for <coughs> Colleen and Mead and Chuck and everybody because they only have to do this one night. We're trying to make it easy for you guys. So you have so much going on here. We want to make lower the burden for leadership of RMLD. <laughs> so, all right. Okay. And then May 16th, does that look good for everybody too? Yeah, that's fine. And then we have, uh, Tom, you'll be at the cab for April and Phil you got, yep, May. I got May. Okay. okay. All right. Want to go to executive session? All right. Yes. So Move motion. that the uh, Board of Commissioners go into executive session to consider purchase of real property to discuss confidential, competitively sensitive and proprietary information in relation to making, selling or distributing electric power and energy 
and to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining and to return to regular session for the sole purpose of adjournment. Second. Second. Okay, discussion. Mr. Pacino, oh. aye. Mr. Hennessy, aye. Step back, aye. 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 We are adjourned. And Karen, thank you for coming.